Oh, Transems. So Transems is a sim city on steroids. Department of Transportation wanted to put in a new light rail system in Portland, Oregon. Multi-billion dollar project. Uh, they were willing to spend $30 million for essentially 100 person years to write a code to make a virtual city of Portland. People going to work, people uh, you know, taking public transit, uh, people going to school. And then they could look, well, if you put the light rail here, how would we reroute traffic? Because you got all the roads. The whole city is, is literally um, in the computer. They took the census data to get to where people live, what their income is. Um, a fraction of a percent of the city were told, has to write down law, keep logs. When did you leave for work? Where, which way did you go? Where did you go for lunch? They took all this and made this $30 million virtual city on the computer. Now we can look at it. Um, so people running around between the buildings, it's quarter million buildings, 1.8 million people. Um, every, every individual, all 1.8 million people, has got an age, an income, a status. Uh, do they take the car? Do they take public transportation? Do they go to school? So here would be a home. We'd say, well, say one person takes a carpool to work has lunch with, uh, working at work with other co-workers, has lunch, goes back to work, carpools, someone else goes shopping, someone takes a daycare. So at any time during the day, we know where every individual is in this virtual city, okay? So now what we can do is we can do things, well, the first thing they did was, uh, let's say, a, a terrorist attack, and they release um, a chemical terrorist, a uh, chemical across the city. Who gets infected? And um, you know who, who is who is exposed to this chemical, uh, and then they can ask, well, how do we, what do we do to contain the chemical? Uh, for instance, we want to. So it's, uh, it's uh, within the city. They can, well, we can set, tell everybody there's been a chemical terrorist attack in downtown Portland. Everybody stay stay put, so we get a ring around the city, and we can wash the cars and and, and make sure that you're not don't carry anything. You know? I don't know about you, but I was in downtown Portland when I heard that I'd get in my car and get out of town like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> but then they can, so this was a transportation model, and they could take the transportation model and say, well, how do we keep people contained? They optimized it, and, uh, and actually the optimizer came up with a really ingenious solution to keep everyone in downtown Portland until they could build a ring around the city to, to cleanse the cars and check the people. The, com the, the computer code said shut off the traffic lights. Instant gridlock. <laughs> so, you, so if you're ever in Portland and it comes an announcement, all traffic lights are out due to a malfunction. <laughs> Don't believe it anyway. So anyways, you shut off the traffic light, gridlock, you set up the ring, and then you do it. So they can do these type of things with the model. Or we can do epidemic modeling. We can say someone comes in from Hong Kong with the new strain of the flu. They go home, um, infect their kids. Their kids go to school and infect other kids. Those kids can infect their parents, then parents infect other parents at work. We can watch an epidemic spread at a micro scale that we've never been able to before. Okay? And we can do our mathematics. If we can't, now, now we can have this virtual epidemic and we can find out how good our mathematical tools work where we know absolutely everything about the city. Because if they don't know any, if they don't work where we know everything about the city, how can we have any confidence in them? when we try to apply them to where we know almost know nothing. Because when a real epidemic happens, we have no idea who's infected except for the people that show up in the doctor's office. So this has become a test bed that's completely dominated the, the mathematical epidemiology for the past decade. Okay. Um, so the kind of things we have, we have this is individual 3780, he had contact with the individual 2540 for a half an hour, uh, activity six, which is they were passenger in the car together. Uh, and then he had contact with 2541 for 0.3 hours, three, they visited, then he went to work for 3.52 hours with this individual. We run this simulation this, uh, for the virtual city, we store everything on a disk, and then we can run epidemic modeling. This is by assuming that people do the same thing every day. I can now run an epidemic model on my, lap, on my uh, laptop in real time. Now, in fact, we don't have other, so we don't, this we call the Groundhog's Day simulation because every day is exactly like the day before. But the, except we add this epidemic form to the system. 
Now, in fact, we have multiple days. We have Saturday, Sunday, work day, holiday, these type of things. We just roll them in. But it's taken, uh, where the Transims took a supercomputer, we can now do this on a laptop, okay? And we can ask questions, um, like when H1N1 came out, and we wanted to know who to vaccinate first. Uh, the question was, well, what, if we want to stop the epidemic, we have something called herd immunity. Remember that R0 had 1 minus P, which P is the fraction that are vaccinated. That was if everybody is mixing randomly in the whole population. Well, that's not the case. People don't mix. Now we don't have, we have a non-random mixing city. So we can ask, well, what happens if we vaccinate randomly like we do every year? What fraction of the people do we have to vaccinate to stop the epidemic? So this is the fraction of the population vaccinated. And this is the percent of the simulations that end in an epidemic. So if we want to cut the probability of an epidemic to half, 50%, we have to vaccinate 80% of the population. On the other hand, we say, well, let's, we can say, do targeted vaccines. We can vaccinate school kids first. Or we can vaccinate people that go to the most buildings first. Uh, the people that have the most contact with other people. Let's vaccinate them first. Bus drivers get vaccinated before we go to the old folks' homes. Okay? And so we do that, and these are different ways. These are how many contacts you have, how many buildings you go into, page rank. We even use the Google page rank algorithm, not how many contacts you have, but how many people that you have contact with, have contacts, etc. Now to get 50% reduced probability of the epidemic, we only have to vaccinate 40% of the population. We have to vaccinate half as many people if we target it to the people that have more contacts first. This is why when we had a limited vaccine, we gave it to the school kids first in the last round. Now, this, we always knew that if you vaccinated the people with lots of contacts, we had to vaccinate fewer people. But we didn't know um, how many fewer people you had to vaccinate. We just know you needed to vaccinate fewer. And the, the idea that you have to vaccinate only half as many uh, really shocked, all, shocked us all. We thought it would be 20% savings or 30% savings. But that you know we have to vaccinate 100 percent more people, you twice as many people if we do it randomly than if we do it targeted. So that was the result that we got out of this. Now these are nice smooth curves. Now in, in practice, this is what the actual runs look like. Um, so these are the percentage vaccinated and the total number of infected people. So these are stochastic. So we, like I say, we, they're randomly where the first person gets infected depends on how far the epidemic goes. If that bus driver was the first person to get infected, it spreads very quickly. If it's an old folks' home, it spreads very slowly. And so we get, so there's a lot of hidden behind this thing. Um, the other thing we found that's been useful is the, the social sciences. Who has contact with whom? So if these are age, say, 17-year-olds. How many contacts a day do they have with other 17-year-olds or 27-year-olds or 39-year-olds? We can look at mixing. So this is someone of age I, so someone of age 10, 20, 30, 40. How much time during the day do they spend with someone of age 10, 20, 30, 40? So it looks like kids spend a lot of time with kids. Okay? Um, adults spend time with adults. And also, kids spend some time with adults since we're parents' age. These things go up quite nicely. So this is information we can glean from it. Um, oh, also something else in here. Notice there's a trough in the middle. I thought there'd be a peak in the middle that eight-year-olds would spend more time with other eight-year-olds. They don't. They spend more time with people that are um, seven and nine or six and ten. They're siblings. What? They're siblings. Siblings, right. You can't, there's this nine-month lag. At least nine months, right? And the home time over, it actually dominates over the school time. Yeah. Took, you, you were quick on that, it took us a while. <laughs> yeah, so these are home activities, and there you can see there's a whole trot, there's no one, you know, if you're eight, you have no contact with eight-year-olds, or 10, you have no contact with 10-year-olds. Uh, we can look at probability of transmission. So if someone is infected, uh, whom are they likely to infect? So kids are likely to infect other kids and their parents. Old folks are more likely to infect old folks. Okay, 
So this is probably, um, if you're age 80, who are you most likely to infect? You might infect people between 70 and 90. We can look at where the major transmission happens in an epidemic. And very quickly, you pick out schools at the epicenter. So these are all things we've done. Originally, we start with the transportation model. Uh, we can look at behavior changes. So we can have, um, so this is normal behavior, and this is uh, reduced behavior, low behavior. So when SARS came, people changed their behavior. They reduced their contacts. That reduced the rate of spread, that um, transmission rate that we talked about. Remember, it's number of contacts per unit time. Um, we can look at effective quarantine and vaccine. We can say, well, let's talk about all different things we can do. If, a, uh, if an epidemic comes, we can vaccinate, we can quarantine, we can change behavior. Uh, we can have what's some called ring quarantine. If someone is infected, uh, we use contact tracing to find all the people they've had contact with, and we quarantine not only them, but everyone they've had contact with. We make a social ring. You know, when we talk about cattle, they actually did a physical ring, or ring quarantine. Now we do a social ring. We do whoever we have contact with, we build a ring around those people and quarantine them. And then we can ask how many, and this was a simulated smallpox attack, which people were worried about after 9-11. Um, if smallpox came, we don't have enough vaccine, what's the best strategy to contain it? And so we looked at different things, and isolation of infected people, quarantine, this is the number of cases, this is time. Ring vaccine was here, by far the most effective way was high behavior change. So we fight this, if smallpox attack comes, or there was an attack, the best way to fight it is the same way it's been fought for centuries. You just reduce your contacts with other people until the epidemic is brought under control. Okay. So these are kind of insights we can get. Um, we can also put uh, behavior changes inside this transsense model. We can, based on, I say, economic status, our age, What's the probability that this person would stay home if there was a smallpox attack? And then we can actually change this individual behavior. Now, we couldn't do that in our continuum models. We can actually do that in these models. If you close the schools, what individuals will stay home and what fractions of their parents will stay home with them? We can actually simulate these type of things on the computer and find out what the impact would be. Now, my, my daughter and her husband and her, and her family live in Portland. And so when we were doing, this is a typical family day in Portland, I decided I would explicitly plug her in. So, Catherine, this is what you do if there's ever a smallpox day. <laughs> <laughs> so you can literally go into these models with that level of detail. Um, now, one of the places that was recently done, used, is where the H1N1 swine flu epidemic happened uh, a couple of years ago. And we were worried because it was very close to the Spanish flu, H1, the previous H1N1 epidemic. This is mortality, number of people dying. And this peak is not due to World War I, that's due to the influenza epidemic. More people were killed by the flu than they were killed by lead poisoning in World War I. Um, and, what we were, and there was two peaks. There was a small peak, and then there was a huge peak. So this is time. Uh, and this is data that we analyzed from Geneva, Switzerland during the um, 1918 epidemic. Uh, and then we started seeing, this is 2008-2009, the red curve, so the seasonal flu are the blue and the green. We see a peak in the winter and then it dies down. The peak in the winter dies down. With this new one, we saw a peak in the winter and then we saw this thing coming up. So not only was the same strain as the 1918 epidemic, but also started showing similar characteristics with a second bump. And so they stopped out all curves. At Los Alamos, literally, we, we took this Episims code, this discrete code, and hunkered down for, for weeks on end to find out, well, how bad could it be? Okay? And they were interested not in a city model. They wanted to see how it was spread across the whole U.S. Okay? Now, I talked about the U.S. with Renderpest, what we did with cattle. We also have the entire U.S., every county in the U.S., uh, how many schools they have, what their work schedule is, the size of the homes, how many people live in each family for every county. So now we can do what I did with that little bitty toy model. We can do it at a level of the entire U.S. population. So we have 300 million, 350 million individual people model on the computer, 
And we can say, well, let's say it starts, um, it originally started in Mexico. And we could watch how the, this is one epidemic, if, if we have no vaccine, how would we expect the epidemic to spread across the U.S.? What the impact, we also have uh, workforce information. What's the impact on the workforce? Uh, what's the impact on the hospitals? And what's going to be the expected load? And then we can start saying, well, now we actually do have vaccines. Uh, how can we deploy these vaccines to, say, keep from overwhelming our hospitals? Uh, how can we have behavior change, close schools, to, uh, to keep it from, uh, to reduce the, the impact of the epidemic? So these are the tools that we're using now, and there are about four models like this around the world. And when H1N1 happened for a week, we all went to Atlanta. Each, each of the four teams went to Atlanta and, and duked it out to find out and find out what they agreed on. And again, don't believe the models. Believe what the, the, learn from the models, but be able to not make the arguments without the models. Okay. And so you can do things. These are target school closures. So this is the epidemic with no um, intervention. And then we can say we have targeted antiviral or antivirals. So these are the um, acyclovir, or, um, uh, antiviral disease. Vaccines, school closures, we can compare all these. We can look at it state by state. This is the fraction, the clinical attack rate. What percentage of the population do you think will become infected? you're predicting become infected uh, if you don't have any mitigation. We looked at that. We have some states like Utah, we have 20, almost 27%. In other places like Vermont, it was like 15% infected. And then we can ask, that's kind of strange. Why is Utah so many more, Utah, mountain air, you know, good sunshine. Um, why, why is Utah so way out here? In Vermont and West Virginia is even, you know, it's 15%, and Connecticut is way down here. And any ideas on what the difference is? Bigger families? Absolutely. That's exactly right. The families are the, the biggest transmission rate. If you're infected, if one of your kids gets infected, the other kids get infected, and you probably get infected. Families are much smaller in, in, in West Virginia and Vermont. So again, we saw this, we didn't understand that we dug back in. Ah, of course. Um, and so that's, so I talked, started off talking about these low resolution models. Then we went to the high resolution model here for the city, for like spread of, uh, let's say, uh, flu and uh, smallpox attack on, Epi on Portland. Then we have the whole US. And now where the modeling is, uh, if you want to click the button, is we can now, we now have the, just click it anyway. Just click it. Okay. Um, we can look, this was the prediction of what H1N1 do is spread around the world. Well, we do put in the airline schedules. Uh, we do have local travel between the different countries. Um, and so we can now ask questions like, well, what if they put in better screening at the airports? Um, you know, you can't get on a plane if you've got a fever and these type of things. Well, where can we expect it to go next? And so this is the current state of the art. Um, and I'm, I'm speaking with too much confidence because one thing we don't have in this model yet is the population needs to be divided better into travelers and non-travelers. And the question is, is if you do get sick, do you cancel the trip? The trip? And if you cancel the trip, do you get your airline ticket reimbursed? So this is one thing we're actually hoping to, to do with this, that if you show up with a doctor's note, um, the airline will re rebook you on another flight without charging you the $150 change fees. Things like that, we could use these, these models to argue for. As it is now, you've got to show up and show them that you're sick before they'll waive the change fee, maybe. <laughs> okay, so some of the predictions are, um, you know, think what you expect, protect, uh, social distancing, impact on the workforce, we can estimate absenteeism with these codes. Um, let's see what... Uh, and again, it comes down to, the question is, is how to fight the epidemic. It comes down to these three factors. So we get the r naught kind of tells us what we need to target. It tells us how much we need to target it. 
but it only tells us in a, in a gross average sense but that sense but now we can actually apply it in these models at a very local sense you know, like reducing the number of contacts per time we can put that in these agents these individuals so they have fewer contacts per time uh, probability of transmission per contact we can um, reduce it we can say let's uh, within the model we have school rooms it's down to the level of school buildings we can say when kids come in the school room they pull up a handy wipe they wipe their hands they wipe their desk they throw it down they do something to reduce the probability of transmission in the school by say 30 percent would that be enough to stop the epidemic well if the r naught is only at 1.2 the answer is yes we don't have to close the schools but now we can actually test it out with these virtual schools um, so number of contacts, you know, staying at home, you can find, figure out, you know, massive education on, on the importance of staying at home. Probability of transmission per contact, teaching people to sneeze into their, their shoulders, you know, these are the massive. You remember all these ads and things that went on during H1N1. This is what's driving behind it. You know, washing your hands. Um, this is actually had a big argument with CDC over this, you know. The question is, is it more important? You know, they say, wash your hands for two minutes with soap and water. Yeah, I'm going to be a surgeon, but is it better to wash your hands twice a day for two minutes or 10 times a day for, two, for 20 seconds? I'm of the opinion that 20 times a day at the small amount is. But if you just wash them, I think it is. Yeah. Social distance, you know, uh, people are really keeping their distance <laughs> during the flu season. Um, and the distance is three feet. You, know, you don't want to be. In, in someone's face. Uh, we're in the middle of a big thing now about uh, wearing masks and making that more acceptable in our culture. In Asian cultures, it's quite acceptable. If you don't feel well, come to work with a mask. And your colleagues are thrilled to see that you care enough for them that you're wearing a mask. You don't wear a mask to keep yourself from being infected. You wear a mask to keep others from being infected. Um, and the two things a mask does. When, when, you're, when you're wearing it, not only does it contain it, but it also keeps your hands off your face. Because how many times a day do we touch our eyes? And the other hand, if you're, if you're not infected and you're susceptible wearing a mask, um, again, the viral particles are, are so small and a mask would be like, you know, like keeping sand out of a chain link fence. You know, they're, just, they're so tiny, they just fly right through it. But it keeps them off your hand. It keeps your hands from touching your face because you can pick up the, the, the flu virus from there and uh, it's very, so the mask does that. Um, vulnerability, oh, oh, the other thing is vaccination. Uh, I ask why, does anyone know why it takes so long to make flu vaccine? Well, yeah, okay, so for like H1N1, we had the vaccine isolated by midsummer, but we weren't getting vaccines till November, December. Well, it was tested and it worked, but the mask can't produce it. It's, it's the roosters. Well, think about this. The poultry, uh, they grow vaccine in fertilized chicken eggs. So they have to fertilize the egg, they infect it with the vaccine or with the virus, it grows, and then they kill the virus and make the vaccine. Okay. So what's the problem? Well, well, poultry farms don't like the roosters. When they get a rooster born, as soon as it gets old enough to be sold in the market, you go to the market here, you're not buying hens, you're buying roosters, okay? And so you don't find very, you find very few roosters old enough to impregnate the, the, uh, the hens, or to impregnate the eggs. And so when you want to have a, a new vaccine, that's, because they'd already killed, they'd made the first round of vaccines, they'd killed the roosters, that sold them. Now they didn't have any adult roosters. They want to make more roosters. Okay, ah, we've got to let these roosters grow up so they're old enough to fertilize the eggs so that we can grow the vaccine. And that, you, they're, they're, you can't speed that up. I mean, they, they mature at the, whatever rate roosters mature. And so within the vaccine industry, this is whole plan ahead type thing. And so even though we could isolate the virus, we could prove its effect, the vaccine was effective, we couldn't produce it until after we had enough fertilized eggs. And so there's this. just like a <laughs> farm of roosters on hay. Can we have some roosters? <laughs> <laughs> no. Really? Well, who's going to pay for it? I'm seeing a social entrepreneur venture. Uh, yeah. You know. yeah. It's your rooster farm. <laughs> it's a rooster farm. Well, they, 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 will, they will let the roosters well, they, get older. Yeah, they're on hay farms. 
Well, the big, the big push now is to try to get rid of the eggs. Rooster sperm bank? What? Rooster sperm bank. That, that's an idea. I don't know about that. <laughs> anyway, okay. Yeah, so anyway. It takes three to six months for these roosters to get old enough, so there's always going to be that delay, at least until we can get rid of the eggs. Until you get rooster farm and sperm bank. And so I'm going to take a, let's take a, a short, like, five-minute break now, because uh, this is the, the end of the talk, and I want to, um, I was asked to bring, get, uh, provide some homework questions. And the homework questions is, is that uh, people like myself, we speak with far too much confidence. You know, we show you, this is how the epidemic will spread across the, the U.S. Guaranteed, that's not the way the epidemic will spread across the U.S. In fact, if I ran the simulation 20 times, I'd show you 20 different ways. And so the question is, as decision makers, you have to decide what you can believe and what you can't believe. Um, predicting a single epidemic is not possible, but you can predict a lot of properties of that epidemic. So the question is, what is predictable, what is not predictable? Um, and if I ever get a chance as a decision maker to work with someone with a simulation, what questions do I ask this person that they can give me information that I can find useful? And what useful information do I have that I can give the, the person running the code uh, to improve the quality of their advice? Okay. So the, the whole other thing is it's, we moved, when I started in the business of simulation, it was, it was give us the best answer you can. Uh, write the, the most complicated equations you think are appropriate. Take the biggest computer, Los Alamos has the biggest computers in the world. Uh, use the biggest computer in the world run it as much as you want and give us your best answer. And that's no longer good enough. Um, now we've got to quantify what we believe in the answer with respect to what the assumptions are that went in. And you see this like with hurricane predictions. You don't get it. The hurricane's going to hit, you know, uh, at this point four days. You see this cone of probabilities of where it might hit. Uh, and those cones have slowly gotten smaller over the years. Um, because we've learned to do things better. But they've, at least that community, the hurricane community, has learned how to communicate the uncertainty to the public. Uh, the epidemic modeling community has not. And so if you, in the same way with earthquake modeling and all these other models out there, most of them forest fire models, if you deal with the people doing the simulations, you need to find that common ground where they're between kicking them out, you know, not letting them in the door, kicking them out of the building, or letting them in and finding out what they can help you with that's useful. And it's got to be kind of a two-way street.